All right, welcome back. This is Mr. Wakefield, and uh, we're looking at 9.4 right now. Um, more properties of logarithms, and I want to uh, start things off by making sure we understand something really important as we get into more properties, is that I really need you to um, really uh, start things off with a clean slate when it comes to logarithms. All right, I don't want you to combine... Uh, whenever you do anything with a logarithm, I don't want you to combine things that you learned in the past that had nothing to do with logarithms, all right, uh, combining that stuff with this. I don't want you to do that. For example, um, a mistake that a lot of students make uh, is that, see the X right here? Uh, they'll pull this out in front of the logarithm, or if there's already something in front of the logarithm, for example, the 5 right here, maybe they'll move it into the product term here with the X, all right? Uh, because that's kind of similar to uh, when we did stuff with, you know, greatest common factor and factoring and stuff like that. Um, I really need you to, uh, when you do logarithms, to only do things that we learned in regards to logarithms. Don't do any of the properties we learned in the past when we were just doing normal polynomials uh, before we started talking about logarithms. All right, don't do any of that stuff. Don't assume that any of that works, all right? And whenever you work with logarithms, only do things that uh, we learned uh, were a lot. Uh, only do things that uh, we we uh, learned in these uh, logarithm sections, which is from 9.3 to 9.6. Uh, only those things are okay. So when I say have a clean slate, you need to get everything that you've learned in the past regarding other stuff besides logarithms, and you need to keep that separate and just focus on the things that we learn in these four sections whenever you do something with a logarithm, whether it's an equation, you're simplifying something, whatever. All right. Um, and so, no, you could not move the 5 into here. No, you could not take the x and move it out of here. However, there is ways to move stuff in and out of a product term. We'll learn that, but you have to follow that rule that we learn here in these four sections from 9.3 to 9.6. Um, and so really want to encourage you and, and make sure you understand how important that is. Uh, another thing I want to make sure we understand, we kind of talked about a little bit in... The previous section is what is the product term? How do you know what it is? Um, whenever you have just a single term um, next to the base right here, just zoom in right there. Um, so you got the base of seven right there, and then right next to it is the, supposed to be the product term. If there's just a single term right there, whether it be 49, or if it's, uh, for example, uh, xy to the third, that's just a single term. Whether the brackets are there or not, that's the product term. However, if you have something like this, see how after the base right there, you've got the log, and then you've got the little base underneath the g, which is where it's always located, underneath the g. If you would right next to that have a term, and then you have addition or subtraction after that, and then another term, and as you guys know, addition and subtraction breaks things up into different terms, right? Different you know monomial terms. Um, when that happens, if there's no parenthesis next to the x right here, um, if there's no parenthesis around the x plus six, then only the closest term uh, goes with that logarithm right here. So this x right here. That is the product term of that logarithm. The 6 is completely separate from that, okay, when there's no parenthesis there, okay? And this is as opposed to what we did at the end of the last section. Look at this, all right? When you do have a parenthesis, there it is right there. When you have a parenthesis next to uh, the base right there, then the entire parenthesis is your product term. So the 6 in this case is not separate, even though there's more than one term here, because the if there's a parenthesis right next to the base, which is 5 here, then that uh, entire parenthesis would be your product term. So just want to make sure you understand that, like a, in a lot of area, other areas of math, the parenthesis does make a big difference. All right. If the parenthesis is not there, then only x would be your product term. If the parenthesis is there, then the entire parenthesis is your product term. Um, let's flip back over and get started here. We've got three additional properties here. All right. Uh, again, don't invent your own. Don't invent your own properties here. Okay. Um, 
just stick with what we learn in these next four sections from 9.3 to 9.6 in regards to what you do with logarithms. But these are three properties we can use. And you'll notice here that, see what it has right here? See how uh, uh, you've got an exponent right here and then you can move it to the front of the logarithm. It's saying you can take this P right here and move it to the front of the logarithm and it's equal. All right, that's what I meant earlier when I said that you could move stuff from inside of the product term outside of the logarithm, but it has to be in this particular instance. It can't just be anytime you have uh, something inside of the product term. Right? It has to be when you have a base and an exponent here. I'll talk about this more here in just a moment. But again, we got to stick with what we learn here in regards to logarithms. So let's look at the first question here. It says... Um, expand each logarithmic, logarithmic expression as much as possible. All right, no log products. In other words, uh, that's the same thing as product terms. All right, remember the product term is the answer you get when you combine the base and the exponent together. All right, the base being the thing underneath the G and then the entire logarithm is equal to the exponent itself. All right. Um, if your product, and I, I said no product term shall equal products, quotients, or powers. What does that really mean? It means that if your product terms look either like something times something, this is the first property up here where you have something times something, and it's just those two things. It's something times something. It's not something times something and then some other stuff too. Like, for example, in problem B, see how we have E times X? That's something times something. But the problem with this is that the radical is also there. If it had just been E times X only, then it would fit into this property right here, property number one at the top of this page. All right. Um, so in order to use that property, we would have to get rid of the radical first. I'll talk about how to do that. Okay. But I just want you to understand what they mean up here by M times N. All right. It's when you have just two things in your product term being multiplied together and nothing else there. All right. Uh, if you have just a fraction as your product term. All right, nothing else but just the fraction, nothing outside of it. Okay, this is a good example of that right here. All right, you just have a, a fraction as your product term next to your base, okay, which is five. And then finally, if your product term is just a base and an exponent, again, no other stuff. Okay, you can see here that this does not qualify because uh, what is the base for the three? It is just y. Okay, when it's written like this, only the y is, just like it always is, whenever you have a, a, a variable next to an exponent, unless there's a parenthesis in between the y and the 3 right here, only the y and not the x is your base that's taken to that power. x is not being taken to the third power. And so you would have to separate the x from the y to the third, and then once the y to the third is a product term by itself, then you can use this property, which is the third property at the top of the page, because y to the third would then fit into this. Okay, It has to be just a base and an exponent, not something in front of that also. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk about all of this stuff here as we go along, but just wanted to give you an idea of what, we're, what direction we're going here. So let's jump into it. Uh, it says expand it out. What they mean by that, you guys, when they expand out a logarithm expression, it means that if uh, your logarithm looks like one of these three things on the left side of the equal side, one of these three things right here, then what you want to do is you want to uh, convert it to one of these over here. Okay? So you can see in the first problem, in the first problem, you have just a fraction it, uh, uh, just like it has here at property number two, you have just a fraction and that's it. So it fits right into the second property. And so they're saying, hey, convert it from this form to this form. How do, what does this mean exactly right here? It means to take the numerator, which is the M, and the denominator, which is N, and split it apart with a subtraction symbol. Okay, let's do that right now. All right, um, so I get log base 5 of square root of X minus log base 5. Please make sure your uh, bases are still the same. If the original one has base 5, the two new logarithms that you create, that also must be that same base. Okay. Um, now, 
So that's what I did right there. I took this thing right here and I expanded it out into two separate logarithms. That's what they mean by expanding it out. Going from one of these over here to one of these things on the other side of the equal sign. And you keep on doing that until none of your product terms look like these. All right. Okay, let's stop right there. Uh, this is just one single number, so it doesn't look like any of these, right? Okay. You could say 25 to the first power. You, you don't have to. Um, if the exponent is 1, you don't, uh, you don't have to do this property. Um, because if you move the 1 to the front right here, it's just going to be 1 times the new logarithm, and 1 times anything doesn't need to be written. You don't need to write 1 times something. So, but what about this? Okay, as we learned back in section 7.2, uh, when you have the square root of something, all right, uh, let's just remind ourselves of that up here. When you have the square root of something, uh, it is the same thing as, and again, this is from 7.2 if you want to go back and look at it. It's the same thing as x to the 1 half. All right, same thing uh, if you have like the cube root of something. It's the same thing as the inside of the radical being taken to the one third power. All right, just a little bit of review there. So you can't just look at this and say, oh, hey, it doesn't look like any of this. Because if you have a radical, you guys, a radical can be converted to an exponent. And then probably uh, it will end up looking like this in a lot of cases. But you got to at least try and find out. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this to x to the 1 half. You have to do that if you've got a radical. Because then we can actually expand it out. All right. Um, by using the third property here. The third property says what? It says that if you have x to the 1 half, just the base and the exponent, nothing in front of the x, which is the base. If you have x to the 1 half, you can put the 1 half in front of the log, and then you just have x. See how the exponent's gone over here? Uh, the exponent essentially moved to the front. So x to the 1 half becomes 1 half in front, and then just x over here. Okay, let's write that down. 1 half... Oh, I'm sorry. One half in front. Okay, and that's multiplication right there. Okay. Uh, and then log base 5, of, and then just the x now. All right. Um, so we're basically done now because x is just a, if you just have x to, and it's just a variable only, and if you have just a number only, then it, none of, neither of those two things, the x and the 25, neither one of those things, and I, I know I'm still going to write, I'm going to bring this down, don't worry, I'm going to talk about that here in a minute. But our only two product terms we have left right here are x and 25. None of those two things look like any of these three. And so since I don't, since none of my product terms look like any of those, I'm basically done. What they also want us to do, though, is they want us to take, if you see a logarithm, just like in the last section, just like in the last section, if you see a logarithm that uh, has uh, no variable in it, Typically, that means that they want you to evaluate the logarithm, which means to actually figure out what the logarithm is equal to, and then the log, the L-O-G letters actually go away. Kind of like when we evaluated radicals back in Chapter 7. If you evaluate, you actually figure out what it's equal to, and then the radical goes away, all right, because you're actually computing the radical. All right, the radical goes away. In the same way, if you're evaluating the logarithm, which means you're figuring out what it's equal to, you're figuring out what that exponent is equal to, 10 to what power is equal to 100. That's what the logarithm is equal to. It's equal to that missing exponent. When you figure that out, then you are, the logarithm, the LOG letters should go away and you just have an exponent left over. That's what we typically do if you have no variable in your logarithm at all. You don't have one in the base and you don't have one in the product term. That's the case here. So what they want you to do is figure out what this logarithm is equal to. All right, so that'll be the final part of the problem here. If you see one of those logs with no variable in it, uh, go ahead and compute it. Five to, isn't this a five to what power equal to 25? Okay, remember logarithms are exponents. So it's asking if the base is 5 and the product term or the answer, in other words, is 25, then what's the missing exponent? It is 2. And so that entire logarithm is equal to 2. All right? And so there we go. All right. Um, let's keep going here. Again, 
I can't do MN because it has the radical there. If the radical wasn't there, then it would look like this and we could do the first property up at the top of the page. Uh, but here's the thing. I can do this one here because uh, this is the same thing as this right here. You got to put a parenthesis around that. We learned this back in 7.2. Uh, we talked, I'll bring it up here for you. Just give me a moment. Um, and I'll pull that up for you. 7.2, here we go. If you have um, a term inside of your radical and you need to convert it to the exponent, uh, you got to put a bracket around that. Now, I didn't do that on the first part here because I knew that it didn't matter, all right? If it's just a variable only, you could put a bracket around the x, but you don't have to, okay? But it, um, if I don't put a bracket here, though, uh, it'll look like x is the only uh, thing that's being taken to the one-half power, and that's not right. Uh, whenever you have, uh, whenever you convert from a radical to an exponent, the entire inside of the radical has to be taken to that fraction power, and so, um, if uh, the parenthesis indicates that, then you got to put that parenthesis there. If I hadn't put the parenthesis here, it would have looked like just y was taken to that power. Okay, uh, but that's not the case. We're, the entire inside is supposed to be taken to that power. So put a parenthesis around that if um, it makes a difference. All right, and it definitely does because if I hadn't put it there, it would have looked like just part of the inside of the radical was taken to that power. Okay. Uh, so you can always put a parenthesis just in case. It's just that here I didn't need it because the x, uh, if it's just a variable with nothing in front of it, not 3x or 4x, but just x, then you don't need the parenthesis there. It's, it means the same thing with or without the parenthesis around the x right here. But here, uh, it uh, makes a big deal. It, it's a big difference here. So put a parenthesis there unless you're sure it doesn't matter is what I'm saying, uh, just like we did in 7.2. Okay, what this indicates, though, you guys, is that since the parentheses is there, that means that that entire thing is the base right there, not just the x, but the entire thing. Um, and so I can use this rule right here because this rule says that the base, no matter how big it is, all right, and you can even put a parenthesis around this to remind you that parentheses count as long as there's nothing in front of the parenthesis or behind it. Uh, other than the exponent, uh, then um, you can use this rule, all right? Um, so as long as uh, your entire thing is a base and an exponent and nothing else, even if the per, uh, base is just some big parenthesis, that still counts. It's still the base. You can then move the one-half to the front, and if it's just the base only with nothing else, you don't need to keep the parenthesis there if you don't want to, although you can. It's not wrong. Okay, you're not going to be marked down or anything. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but now, um, now I have just e to the x there because, again, when you use that third property at the top of the page, the exponent literally moves away from the product term so that it's not there anymore and it's now just in the front only. Now that the product term looks like mn, I can now do what? I can now go like this right here. I can break it apart according to addition. That's the first property. The mn property is the one with the addition. Okay, but you need to put a bracket around this. Let me tell you why. Okay, as we've said many, many times this semester, when you have two... Uh, terms, okay, and I know these aren't normal terms here, but when you have two things the, with addition or subtraction in between them, whether it be like, for example, let's say we had a x plus 5, just as an example, separate problem here, just an example, okay, uh, if I needed to multiply this entire thing by one half, I would have to bracket it, because if you got something with two terms in it and the whole thing needs to be multiplied by something else, you got to bracket it, all right? It's the same thing here because of the plus sign. Okay, if you've got two things with addition or subtraction in it, just like you do with two terms, addition or subtraction in between, all right, you, it, you have to put a bracket around that if that whole thing needs to be multiplied by one half. And I know that this entire thing has to be multiplied by one half because the original thing that it came from, the original ln that it came from, was being multiplied by one half. 
So the lesson here, you guys, is that if you have a LN or a log, remember LN is just like log, you guys. It's just a special kind of log. So all these properties at the top of the page also apply to LN. But uh, if you have a single log or LN that's being multiplied by something, then if it expands out into two separate uh, LNs or two separate logs, all right, with plus or minus in between it, you got to bracket that thing. Okay, that's the lesson there. So we're pretty much done here with these properties because the E and the X are our new product terms and they are just single numbers and single single number and single variable here. All right, none of them look like one of these three things. So we're done, but like I told you, okay, um, if you have, a, remember E is a constant number, it's not a variable. All right, it's 2.71828. Not that you got to write that down right now, but that's what it is, okay? But we know that because of the fact that this is log base E of E, all right, that's log base E of E, we know that that's equal to 1, isn't it? Because, again, that is what? That is E to what power equal to E? And we know that E to the first power is equal to E because E and E are the same thing, so the exponent's got to be 1. All right, just like if you had eight to, eight to the first power equal to eight or 10 to the first power equal to 10, the exponent's got to be one when these two things are the same. So this is going to be this right here. And that's your final answer. They, again, they just want you to evaluate the logs in these problems if they have no variable in it, like this one right here. Remember, E, again, is not a variable, even though it looks like it. Okay. Um, yes, you could distribute out that one half if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay. If you are going to multiply a regular term times a ln or a log, though, you got to keep the one half in front. You can't, like I said before, you can't multiply into a product term from the outside. Okay. Just like we said earlier about the five right here, you can't just multiply that into the x. All right. So this would be what? Again, completely optional here. You could say this right here, though. Okay, so you could distribute that out, all right, but you got to keep so something that's outside of a log or ln has to be kept outside, unless you specifically use a property to move it inside, like, like this one right here. But you, again, you don't have to do that here, all right, they're not asking for that. Um, All right, so what I want you to do right now is to try problems one through four. Please keep in mind that... Um, um, Especially with problem number two, you got to split apart the x and the y to the third using this property right here because it's x times y to the third, m times n. So you can put the x here and the y to the third here, and then you can split it apart before you uh, take care of that exponent right there. All right, so try that out. Uh, try out the other ones as well, and uh, hit the play button when you're ready. Okay, number one looks like what? Uh, again, we want to have either mn, let me write it down here, mn, m over n, or m to the p, right? Okay, if uh, your product term or any of your product terms look like that, we need to expand those out. This uh, one right here looks like the fraction here, m over n, right? So use the second property at the top of the page, and that gives me this right here. Again, if you have just a single number and a variable as your product terms, then you're done pretty much with these three properties, but you just need to realize that if you have a logarithm with no variable in it, we need to evaluate that. So 5 to what power, you guys, is equal to 125? Well, we know that 5 to the third power is 125, and so that means that um, this logarithm is equal to 3. Because logarithms are equal to what, you guys? They're equal to exponents. The 5 is the base. The product term is the answer. And so the missing exponent is 3. And that's why the entire logarithm becomes 3. Okay, moving down here to problem number 2. Okay, let me move that over. There we go. Uh, again... We can't do this property right here because the x is getting in the way, as we mentioned a few minutes ago. So we need to use this property because this property does fit. Anything that fits, go ahead and use it and just keep on going until none of these three things fit anymore. Okay, this one fits. So we can split up the x and the y to the third, like that. 
according to property number one at the top of the page. And then uh, the X is done now, but the Y to the third, because it's just a base and an exponent only now, it fits into this one now. And so I can move the three to the front of that one. Don't move it to the front of the entire problem. Just move it to the front of that logarithm that it came from. That's what the property tells you to do. Now all I got left is just the X and the Y. If you, again, if your uh, product term is just a single number and that's it, or if it's just a single variable with no exponents or no coefficient in front of the variable, it's just X and Y, then you're done with these three properties. And since these logarithms have variables in it, you don't need to do any of that evaluating stuff that we did on some of the problems. Uh, problem number three. Remember, you guys, uh, that uh, uh, any of these three things that fits, go ahead and use it until you can't use anything else anymore. Since this thing right here is a, just a single fraction and that's it, I can split it apart according to this property right here. And it looks like this right here. Notice that I also changed this to, uh, to the one-half power because, as I told you, when you get radicals in these problems, we need to convert them to fraction exponents because the exponent then can be moved to the front of the logarithm. Okay, why did I put a bracket around the x plus 1? It's because you have to put a bracket around the entire inside of the radical unless you're sure it doesn't make any difference, We're talking about the bracket. It does here. Because if the bracket wasn't here, it would look like just the 1 is taken to the 1 half power. Okay, so put a bracket around it if there's any doubt at all. Okay, it never hurts to use it. Use it. Then, uh, because of, this is just a base and an exponent, I can use this property right here. I can move the 1 half to the front. I also, um, and by the way, you got to keep that bracket right there. Uh, even though that's just the base left over because it's got two terms in it. If you got rid of the bracket when there's two terms there, uh, it would look like X was just the product term. Okay, so uh, I know I said earlier that, oh, you don't need to keep the bracket if it's just the base left over after you move the exponent to the front. You do have to keep the bracket, though, if it's more than one term because otherwise it'll look like uh, the product term is just the x only all right so if there's two terms definitely keep the bracket there even if you move the exponent to the front okay um and then i went ahead and evaluated this radical or i'm sorry i evaluated this logarithm because it didn't have any variables in it since 8 to the second power is equal to 64 this logarithm then is equal to 2. okay number four Again, it's just a single fraction, so I can split it apart according to the numerator and denominator. Remember, that's a subtraction. I can then what? I can then uh, realize that z squared, since that's just a base and an exponent that fits into this property, so I can move the 2 to the front of this logarithm. But what about this uh, product term over here? Can I do anything with that? Uh, do not move the 3 to the front yet. Okay, remember. If it's just x to the third only, then you could have moved the 3 to the front. But because it's x to the third times y, then you got to split apart the y from the x to the third first. Okay? It's not just a base and an exponent only. The y is also there. So you got to split those two apart like that. Okay? Since it's x to the third times y, it fits into this m times n thing. So I use that property to split those two things apart, x to the third and y. I then, uh, like I told you I was going to do, I move the 2 to the front of this logarithm. And then, since this is now, uh, since uh, x to the third now fits into the MP uh, property, I can then move the 3 to the front of that one. And now all three of my product terms that I have left, x, y, and z, all of them are just single variables. All right. No exponents, nothing in front of the variables, all right? They're just variables. And so that means that uh, we can't use these properties anymore, all right? And there's no logarithms to evaluate because they all have variables in them. And so this is truly done, okay? What we're going to do now, you guys, as I move on into the next part, is we're going to go backwards now. All right, let me pull out the clean sheet of paper here again. We're going to go backwards now where uh, our, our problems that I give you will now look like these over here on the right-hand side of these formulas, and you need to make it look like the left-hand side. In the previous problems, we did the opposite. They look like this originally, and you had to make it look like this. Now they look like this, and you got to uh, convert them to look like this. 
All right. Look at what the directions say. It says use the properties of logarithms. All right. In particular, they're referring to the ones at the top of the page uh, to condense each logarithm expression. So we're going to condense it down instead of expand it out. And so um, it says the answer should be a single logarithm. So you should just have one log left in your answer whose coefficient is one. What that means, because we don't usually talk about coefficients when we talk about logarithms. Like I said, the rules are different. But what they mean by that is just like when you have like a variable with nothing in front of it, we say that the coefficient is one. You know, like if we had like x squared, that's the same thing as having an invisible one in front of it, isn't it? Okay. Same thing here. They want nothing in front of the logarithm. All right. So what they really want here, what they're really asking for is a single logarithm with nothing in front of it. Okay, single logarithm with nothing in front of it. All right. Um, let's see how we can do that. Does this look like, let me put the properties right in front of you here. Does this right here look like any of these three on the right-hand side? Yeah, it looks like this one, doesn't it? Because you have log plus log. Again, ln, uh, ln is the same thing as log. It's just base E, that's all. So ln plus ln fits right into this right here. And so how do we condense this down? It means to take the M and the N and multiply them together and make it into one logarithm. Let's do that. Remember, you got to keep the base the same. So if it's LN plus LN, it's still going to be LN when you condense it. All right. Uh, because it has to be the same base. LN means base E. And so base E and base E right here, that means it's still base E right here. And that's why it's still uh, LN. LN means base E. All right. So I did it. All right. I came up with a single logarithm with nothing in front of the logarithm here. And so I'm actually done. That was a very quick problem right there. Okay. If this is just a single term right here, uh, it's not like 7x plus 3 or 7x minus 5, then you don't need a bracket there for your product term. All right. You could put a bracket around 7x. That's not wrong to do that. You just don't. It's not just not mandatory. It's not mandatory to do that. Um, next one. Oh, hey, it's log plus log again. Let's use the first prop. No, 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 that's not right. Though. Let's not use the first property. Why not? It's because look at the look at this property here on the right hand side. Notice how there's nothing in front of the logarithms. OK, but up here, there's a five and a six in front of these logarithms. OK, you can only use this property if you have log plus log, but nothing in front of the logs, though. Nothing in front. OK, and so I need to get rid of those uh, two numbers, five and six, before I can use this property. Is there a way to do that? Yes, there is, because uh, this property right here says that if you have a five in front, it can then become the exponent over here. Same thing with the six. Let's try that out. OK, but that's the thing, you guys. I have to get rid of the five and the six, though. That's why I'm focusing on that. I have to get rid of that. All right. Otherwise, I won't be able to get rid of the two logs here. The only way I can combine two logs getting added together into one, which is what we need. We need a single log of them. Otherwise, the problem will never be done unless we get that. But the only way I can take those two logs with the plus in between it and make it into one is to get rid of the five and the six in the front. That's why I'm focusing on the five and the six first. All right. So what does this become here? the five is in front it becomes same base base b and then you have x to the fifth all right the five comes over here and it becomes the exponent all right just like right here you have mp all right it's m to the p power so the five was in front it became uh, mp that would be the same thing as x to the fifth all right because the x was the m right there it's the same thing as the m here the p moves over there and it becomes x to the fifth all right let's try that again bring down the plus that's still there and then y is the same thing as m right here it's just a product term okay if you want to move the six you have to what you have to make it into an exponent so now it's y to the six so the old product term is still there it's just that you attach this new exponent to it now that i have nothing in front of my logarithms you guys now i can use this property log plus log with nothing in front of the logarithms 
Okay, what does it tell me to do again? It tells me to take my product terms that I now have and it tells me to multiply them as I condense this down into a single log of them simultaneously. So as you're combining those two logs into one, uh, the new product term becomes x5, y6. Okay, and there you go. Again, you could put a bracket around that new product term if you want to, since it's kind of big, but it's not necessary because that's still just a single monomial term, uh, as we learned monomial terms in the past, because of the multiplication. Multiplication does not separate into two separate monomial terms. It's addition and subtraction uh, that does that uh, when it comes to you know monomials becoming a binomial or uh, two terms or more, or more than two terms. It's the addition and subtraction symbols that do that. So the multiplication keeps this as all one term here. No bracket necessary. Okay. Um, problem E. Again, same idea, you guys. All right. I can use this property. Now, you see how it says log minus log? Same thing with ln minus ln. All right. Um, you can use this property if you, first of all, get rid of what? The 2 and the 1 half. Okay, um, so how do I do that? Well, again, when you have a number in front of the logarithm being multiplied, as long as it's being multiplied by the logarithm, as it says right here, p times the log, then it can become the exponent with your old product term. Okay, so the x becomes x squared. All right, so it literally converts into an exponent. The 2 is no longer in the front. It moves into exponent form. All right, it moves and becomes an exponent simultaneously. Same thing with the one half. All right, please don't move the negative, you guys. There is a way to do that, but then you're going to have a negative exponent, and those are always harder to deal with. Sometimes we have to deal with them, and so we do in that case. But uh, if we can avoid negative exponents, all the better. So don't move the negative. All right, the minus is okay to keep there. All right, as you'll see here in a minute, and then um, the uh, one half. And so, uh, again, the uh, one-half goes into the exponent using property number three. Uh, and so now what we have is, once again, just like in the last problem, nothing in front of the logarithms, nothing in front of them. And so now it looks just like property number two here on the right. All right, again, ln and ln counts here. Uh, since LNs are logs, and so it's LN minus LN with nothing in front. That allows me to take the two product terms that are separate over here and make them into uh, a fraction, all right? And then it'll just be a single logarithm, or in this case, a single LN left over. All right, let's do that now. And we did it, you guys. And you, I usually like to put a bracket when it's a fraction. It's Again, it's not... You're not going to get marked down if you don't do that. Uh, as long as there's not anything behind the fraction that's supposed to be part of the product term. Uh, if it's just a, if your product term is just a fraction, it's not completely mandatory to put the bracket there. Um, but I just like to do that. Uh, this is an acceptable answer. Um, but just to let you know, the textbook, when they uh, condense their logarithms down into just one logarithm, if there's any fraction exponents in the answer, they like to convert that back to a radical. All right, uh, and as I mentioned up here at the top of the page, uh, when you have something taken to the one half power, that something goes inside the radical and it becomes a square root, section 7.2 again. And so if you convert this back to a radical, it becomes square root of y on the bottom, doesn't it? Again, optional thing there to do that. What's important is that you get the uh, ra the um, you get the problem down into a single logarithm with nothing in front of it. That's what's important here. Okay. One more problem on the back before I ask you guys to try some. Three logarithms, or in this case, three ln. Same thing, though. All right. Um, you can see here that we got uh, ln plus ln minus ln. So it's kind of like a combination of pro uh, properties one and two right here. Okay. But... Each one of those three logarithms has a number in front of it. So it would be a good idea to move the three 
the 5 and the 6, not the negative 6, but just the 6, to the inside of the product term as property number 3 allows us to do, okay, uh, as we've been doing. And then uh, I will then be able to then combine the logarithms together with the plus and the minus there because then there won't be anything in front of the logarithms. All right, so when you condense your logarithms down into a single logarithm, you always want to use this property first if there is anything in front of your logs because then that's what opens the door for you to be able to use these two right here since these two do not allow for anything in front of the logarithms. Okay. So, um... What would this be then? It would be ln of x to the third using property number three. Uh, bring down the plus. ln of y to the fifth. And ln of what? ln of z to the sixth, right? Again, the number in front becomes the exponent. The product, the old product term is still there, but it now has an exponent attached to it. Okay. Then what? Well, uh, I can't do both of these at the same time, but what I can do is I can do, uh, it's kind of like just when you, uh, when you uh, for example, back when you first uh, uh, were uh, learning about math in elementary school and they said, hey, what's 3 plus 5 minus 4? All right, what did you do? You, you added first from left to right, didn't you? You, know, you did the addition first, and then you did the subtraction. It's the same idea here, okay? Do the two LNs that are being added together first since they come first, and then do the minus after that. Same type of approach there, okay? Uh, so combining these two together, what do I get? I get x to the third, y to the fifth, using property number one. The two old product terms get multiplied together into one logarithm. And then... Now all I got left, you guys, just like up here if you had 8 minus 4, all I got left is the subtraction of the logarithms. And subtraction of the logarithms means what? It means that we have... Um, it means that we have uh, this second property right here. Okay, because there's nothing in front of the logs. We got subtraction in between a couple of logs there. And so that allows me to condense it down into a single log right here by making it in, into a fraction here. And so what does that fraction look like? It looks like x to the third, y to the fifth, divided by z to the sixth. Again, the bracket is optional here. And there you go. Okay. All right. Please try uh, problems five through eight right now. They're all very similar. Um, again, remember that if you've got a number in front of a logarithm, move that into the product term first so that you can then do all of the pluses and minuses that are in between the logarithms after that. Okay, and hit the play button when you're ready. Okay, number five right here. Uh, as you can see here, there's nothing in front of the logarithms. All right, so this uh, current problem as it stands, looks just like this one right here. All right, log plus log, nothing in front of the log. So I can take the 250 and the four, and in this property again says that you multiply them into a single logarithm. There it is. All right, 250 times four, which is equal to 1,000. And as I told you guys, when you have, uh, and we did it, we have a single logarithm with nothing in front of it. So we're basically done, but as I said, if you have no variable in your logarithm, they'd also like you to evaluate it. Uh, so what this is saying, because the base is invisible, that means the base is 10. The product term means that 10 to what power is equal to 1,000, all right? And we know that 10 to the third power is equal to 1,000, all right? 10 times 10 times 10, and that's why the final answer is just simply 3, all right? Um, and that is number five. So again, evaluate your radicals if there's no variable in them uh, at the end of the problem, at the end of the problem, after you've done everything else that the directions ask you to do. Okay. Uh, here we have just a log minus a log, nothing in front of the logs. So you can jump right into the second property right there. Uh, and uh, that allows you to uh, make it into just a fraction. Okay. And there you go right there. Okay. 
Again, 3x plus 7 because there was a bracket around it. That was the entire uh, product term right there. Okay. So that was your M and that was your N over here. The X was the N over here. Okay. M, N. And so they make it into a single fraction. All right. Number seven. We got to move the five and the two first. Otherwise, I cannot do the property with the minus in it, can I? All right. So I move the five and the two. It looks like that right there. I then uh, realize that now I can use the second property because there's nothing in front of the logs. LN minus LN means that you make it into a single fraction. There you go. And finally, property number eight. Uh, I've got log plus log, but the seven is getting in the way, isn't it? All right. Can't have anything in front of the logs if you're going to use that first property. So I need to move that seven first. There you go right there. Okay. And now that I have nothing in front of the logs and I just have log plus log, that means that I multiply the, uh, the two old product terms into one here and it becomes a single logarithm. Again, the uh, parentheses when there's just a single term logarithm. Okay, if it's just a single monomial term, you don't need the brackets there, but you can put them there if you want. Okay. Um, I wrote this answer key up uh, quite a while ago. For some reason, I put it in there, but it's not necessary. Uh, you can just say it without the parentheses. Okay, so that is how to use those properties to both expand and condense your logarithms. All right, the last thing we need to learn, though, in this section, 9.4, is, as you guys know, in, in each of the last two sections that we've done, whenever I gave you a logarithm that had no variable in it, we were always able to figure it out just by our knowledge of exponents. We knew that 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. All right, we knew uh, there was a problem on the front side that said something like this, log base 8 of 64, okay? And we knew that 8 to the second power was 64, so we just knew that that was the answer, all right, just on our knowledge of exponents. But here's the problem. As we go down here into the last set of problems, I don't know what, in other words, what this is asking right here is it's asking 6 to what power is equal to 17, right? It says to evaluate the logarithm, so we got to figure out what that exponent is, okay? Anytime they tell you evaluate a logarithm, that's what it means, right? Figure out what the missing exponent is. I don't know what that exponent is. If this had been a 6 over here, then I would know what the exponent was. It would be 1. If this was a 36 over here, then I would know the exponent was 2, right? But 17, forget it. I don't know what that is. That's where your calculator comes into play. But there's a problem even with your calculator, though, that we need to deal with. And it's, going to, it's going to give us a little bit more work here, but we'll get through it. Okay, your calculator, it does not matter if you have a two-line scientific calculator or a one-line scientific calculator like this one. All right, um, doesn't matter which one you have. Your calculators only handle two different types of logarithms. Okay, see the LOG button right here, which we also have over here on this one. And the typical scientific calculator, including yours, if you have a one that I've asked you to buy or get, um, that should have uh, that same button uh, there. And it should also have an LN button. Okay, you see right there. Here's the problem. Okay, LN is for base E, and that's fantastic. All right, that's not going to work for base 6, which is what our current problem is asking for. It only works for base E. This one right here, though, uh, this one only works for base 10. I think that's part of the reason why it says just log instead of uh, telling you what the base is. Okay, so the LOG button, you guys, is only for base 10. All right, so neither one of these buttons works for base 6. All right, uh, so... And you can see that that's the case here, that we got the same issue on all four of these problems. None of these four problems right here have either base 10 or base E. If they did, then I could just type it right into my calculator using one of those two buttons that I just showed you. But if it's base 6 or something else other than base 10 or base E, you got to use a special formula that's on the front of your worksheet. It's called the change of base formula. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the base literally from base 6 
to either base 10 or base E. It's your choice, actually, which one you want to do. You'll get the same answer either way. Okay, uh, but uh, see right here where I wrote down log base 6 of 17 underneath the formula? It says that if your base is 6 and your product term is 17, here's what you do. You can use either one of these two fractions. Both of these fractions, again, like I said, will give you the same answer. You can see an example down here where they both gave you the same answer, whether you do log or ln. All right. What you do, though, is the product term, the old product term, becomes the new product term on top. Notice how the base is now base 10, though, because it's invisible. That automatically means it's base 10, right? Okay, and then down here, the old base becomes the new product term down below. Okay, so the product term goes up above and stays as the product term. The old base becomes the new product term down here, and then the new bases are equal to 10. Okay, you know, a way that I like to remember these formulas is that the base, uh, the base always goes on the bottom. In other words, the old base always goes to the bottom. Old base, bottom, base, bottom. All right, they, they start with the same letter, right? The word base and the word bottom. So it just, it kind of helps me remember it a little bit more easily. But the old base goes on the bottom. The old product term goes on the top. And they are both now product terms, okay? And the new bases are 10 and 10 here. You can do exactly the same thing here. Base goes on the bottom over here. Old product term goes on the top. And now the new base is E because it, LN means base E, right? Okay. Again, it doesn't matter which one of those two fractions you use. All right, it'll give you the same answer, your choice. So I'm going to go ahead and use the first one there just to pick something. And I'm, again, I'm going to put the 17, the old product term on top. And I'm going to put the old base on the bottom. Remember, base on bottom, right? And the new base is base 10. Since both of these logarithms have base 10, my calculator can now compute both the top and the bottom of the fraction. And since it can compute both of those things, I can now uh, figure out this whole thing on my calculator. Let me show you how to do that. Okay. The way you do a, with logarithms, the way you do a one-line calculator and a two-line calculator is completely different. In many ways, the opposite. So listen closely here. If you have a one-line calculator, and I'll come to the, back to the two-line in just a moment. If it's a one-line calculator, what you do is you type in the product term first, 17, and then you hit the log button. And what it gives you right there, that right there is what your entire numerator is equal to because that's log 17. So if you want to know what log 17 is equal to with base 10, like this is right here, you just hit the 17 first and then you hit the log button and it'll put the answer on your screen automatically. Now that the answer is on your screen and that's your entire numerator, we hit the division symbol right there to divide by log base 6, or not base 6, sorry, log of 6. Not a base anymore. Log of 6. So how do I figure out how to type in log 6, you guys? I now go 6 first, just like I do with the 17. You hit the 6 first, and then the log. Now that answer right there is just the denominator only. Okay, that's just the denominator. So I still have to hit the equal sign down here at the bottom of the screen, okay, uh, in order to um, get the final answer, and there it is right there. I wrote down over here off to the side and make sure to round that off to three decimal places. Okay, so let's do that right now. It's approximately equal to 1.581. Okay. All right. If you have a two line calculator, uh, let me show you how to do that. Um, the way you do a L and a log is you actually hit the log button first before the 17. Also, if it opens up a bracket next to the log right there, make sure to close it up at the end of the product term. Don't, don't close it up at the end of the problem. Otherwise, the entire rest of the problem will become part of your product term for the, for the log on top. That's not correct. Just the 17 is the product term on top. The 6 is completely separate down here. For, it's the product term of the log down here. So close up that bracket for the 17. Hit a log down here. Again, you hit the log before the 6, just like you hit the log before the 17. Close up the bracket for the 6, since that's, that's the only product term there is 6 on the bottom. Okay. And then we hit equal, 
and you can see we get exactly the same answer. Now, if your calculator is still not giving the right answer, please don't hesitate to contact me, you guys. All right. The typical scientific calculator is one of these two things right here. So, uh, but I can't uh, necessarily uh, answer everybody's question here on the video since everybody's calculator is different. But traditionally, if you're using an approved calculator, it's going to fit into one of these two types here. And so you should be covered, but let me know if something's still going wrong. Let's try that one more time here on problem uh, B or problem H, excuse me. Uh, again, using the change of base formula means to put the old product term on top. Putting the, uh, you know what, actually, you know what I'm going to do? Pardon me. Just to be different, you don't have to. Just to be different, I'm going to use the ln uh, fraction this time from the front of the worksheet. Just to show you that uh, that also is okay to use. All right, I'm going to use this one right here. So ln and ln, but you still put the old product term on the top, and you still put the old base on the bottom, and then you uh, put it in your calculator, you guys, exactly the same way that you put this one in there. Okay, you, the only difference is that you're using the ln button this time instead of the log button, but otherwise you put it in completely the same way. All right. So what are we going to get there? We put it into the one line or two line this time here. And we got uh, 19. Close that up since that's the end of that product term. Uh, LN and then 0 0.3. Okay. Close that up. And we get negative 2.445 and then the next digit after the third decimal place is uh, five or bigger it's six and so that means that the five right there is going to round up to six when that next digit is five or greater then that digit that you're supposed to round off to the third decimal place rounds up doesn't it like that does that surprise you that that's a negative answer? Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay because what did we just figure out? We figured out a log. A log is an exponent, right? Are exponents allowed to be negative? Yeah, they are. Sometimes they're, it's a pain to deal with negative exponents, right? But this is the end of the problem, so we don't have any additional steps to do. Right? Exponents are okay it, to be negative. It's just the product terms can't be negative, as I mentioned at the end of the last section. So I just wanted to make sure there's no confusion there. Product terms, like 19, that can't be negative. But the log itself can be negative. It can be equal to a negative. In other words, the entire logarithm can, because exponents are logs, and exponents can be negative. That is something that we see in math, all right? One other thing I wanted to point out, you know what, actually, I'll point that out after we do these last two problems, excuse me. So what I'd like you to do right now is do problems 9 and 10, type them into your calculator exactly the same way we did the previous two problems. You could do either the log fraction or the ln fraction. Please remember, you guys, there is a ln on both the top and the bottom, and there's a log on both the top and the bottom. Please don't get it confused with this formula here. Okay, yes, we got a fraction right there, but the log is not in both the top and the bottom, all right? Uh, here, you have a single logarithm, and your product term is the fraction. In this formula, you have a fraction and two separate logarithms in the top and the bottom. So this one, the product term is a fraction, okay? then you're taking the logarithm of that fraction. Here you've got two separate logarithms on the top and the bottom, and then the whole problem is a fraction overall, okay? But the logarithms are separate, all right? So just want to make sure you see that there. Sometimes people get those mixed up. So try problems 9 and 10, and then we'll take a look at those answers when you hit the play button. Okay, number nine here. Uh, again, if we use one of those two change of base fractions from the, from the front of the worksheet, uh, we get what? We get um, the old product term on top, the old base on the bottom. They both become product terms there. The new bases are 10 and 10 here. Okay, again, you don't need to write it when it's 10. You just say log. Um, type that in your calculator the same way as before, and it should round off to this right here. Uh, I wrote something down here at the bottom uh, underneath that answer, and uh, you don't need to write this down, but just to help you understand 
what we just found out because I know you're probably thinking, okay, wait a second. We got a log that's equal to a decimal. How can you have an exponent that's equal to a decimal? Because a log is an exponent and the exponent therefore would be the decimal. Okay, how can you take something to the 1.459 power? All right, is this just uh, not something that just doesn't make any sense? No, it, it makes sense. Let me tell you why. And this is why it's good that we have calculators, by the way, as you'll see here in a second. You can always convert a decimal to a fraction. Again, you don't need to write this down. You're not going to need to do this. A calculator will do this work for you. But if you did convert this to a fraction, it would be this fraction right here. And as you guys know, when you have a fraction exponent, that can be converted to this right here. Pretty crazy, huh? Okay. You got the 1,000th root of 16, and then that's taken to the 1459 power. Again, that's why calculators are so nice to have. But the point is that that right there, that crazy thing right there, that is equal to the product term, the original product term. So when you ask the question, 16 to what power? 16 to what power is equal to 57.2, which is what the original problem is asking us here. Okay, that is what they're asking us. Um, then we found out that the answer was this decimal. And now you can see that uh, um, because that decimal is the answer, that uh, because it converts to this fraction and because the fraction then converts to this radical, that this thing right here is what's equal to 57.2. So um, don't need to write any essays on why this is true and all that. I'm just saying that I wanted you to realize that when you get a decimal exponent, you guys, it actually does make sense. Okay, it's hard to imagine without having a calculator, uh, and uh, but your calculator will take the take care of the work for you. But it is actually possible to have a decimal exponent for that for this reason right here. Okay, so just wanted to explain that to you, uh, so that it doesn't seem like we're doing things that don't make any sense at all. Okay, last one here. Um, I'm going to do the ln fraction this time, just to be different. If you did the log uh, fraction, it should give you the same answer I got. Uh, so I, again, old product term on top, old base on the bottom, okay? And I ended up getting this as an answer when I typed it into the calculator in the same way as I've been doing on the previous three problems. And that is the change of base formula. So that concludes section 9.4. As usual, uh, let me know if you have any questions, uh, especially with... Uh, I know we're just now getting used to logarithms and stuff like that. And so please don't hesitate to ask if there's any kind of confusion uh, with anything here. And uh, you have a good day. And we'll see you back uh, next time for section 9.5.